Hello, everybody. Uh, it's, it, it's a fascinating thing to see uh, the meteoric rise of cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies together are worth two trillion dollars, and Bitcoin in particular, they are worth close to a trillion dollars. Until 2020, I did not pay much attention to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Uh, but what I decided was to educate myself on that subject. And that uh, exploration led me to learn a lot about money and how money in general functions and uh, how bit, where Bitcoin fits in. So what I'm going to do is uh, me and my friend Lin Yang, we are putting together a presentation. The first part is going to be on money, history, history of money, functions of money, where it all started and where we are. So I'll be spending time talking about that. Then Bitcoin, uh, then Lin will be doing a deep dive on Bitcoin and he'll be doing his presentation, right? Uh, a disclaimer, uh, one, I do not, I never owned a Bitcoin and I do not own Bitcoin now and I do not have plans to buy Bitcoin in the future. So I'm neither a bull of Bitcoin nor a bear of Bitcoin. I'm just a curious student trying to learn what is under the hoods and in the process, I'm just putting together this presentation. With that, let's get started. Okay, so I'm just going to put this in present mode. Okay. So uh, the stones that you see, uh, this huge stone was used as money in a place called as Yap Island. Where is Yap Island? Yap Island is part of uh, Micronesia, uh, where it is say closer to Indonesia or maybe from Japan also it is close, right? So the stone that you see, a typical stone, it is carved out of limestone, right? And the beauty is Yap Island does not have any limestone. Then where does the islander get these stones from? They have to either go to the nearby island of Guam or they have to go to another island called as Palau where they would go, uh, a lot of islanders would have to take a boat. They would have to go to these islands. They would have to carve out these stones from huge limestones. And some of the stones, a typical stone would weigh somewhere between say three to four metric tons. Think about the weight of an elephant, right? That's how heavy these stones are. Now these stones have to be carried back from these islands into the, they have to be converted over back into the Yap Island. It takes a lot of blood and sweat to get these stones. Now what the islanders do is they put all the stones in one central place and the stone ownership will be known by everybody. Say, for example, I'm going to pay Lin Yang, right? I would invite all the islanders to the central place. And I will announce to everyone saying that this stone now belongs to Lin Yang, right? All the islanders would know. So things were working fine until uh, a person by name, uh, David O'Keefe, he enters the island in 1871. Uh, what happened was he got uh, his ship got wrecked and the islanders would rescue him when he enters the island he sees that the island was uh, rich in coconuts and he uh, wanted to uh, ship the, these coconut back to the coconut oil producer so that in the process he would make money so he'll invite the islanders to work for him help uh, help him uh, get all the coconuts but the islanders they were happy with their life and they had no reason to work for david okefe so they said no david okefe will not take no for an answer so what he did was he went to hong kong he procured a bigger boats he procured a lot of explosives using better boats and explosives he was able to extract uh, the stones limestones from guam and palau without much help and he used the, these newly procured stones using technology to pay the islanders. Now the village chief, I mean, the chief of the islander, he was a smart person. He said, look, don't work for David Okefe stones because they were procured without sweat and blood. They were produced easily. So do not work for him because you do, our island will have a lot more stones and the value of all our stones will go down. But the villagers did not listen. And what happened next was very clear where the currency or the stones lost value. David Okefe got rich because he got all the coconuts and he got money paid to him in different currency from all the coconut oil producers, right? So moral of the story here is, uh, you know, harder the money, uh, harder to procure the money, the sound it is, right? So that's one. Now moving from Yap Island into West Africa, 
So in West Africa, glass was much hard to make, right? Because the technology in Africa was not that advanced. So it took a lot of effort to make glasses. So Africans were using beads made out of glass. It could be necklace, it could be bracelets, or it could be some shape and form where glass is used and uh, it was used as currency. It was going well until Europeans came into West Africa. They noticed that West Africa was very rich in resources. And in Europe, Europe had a way advanced technology than West Africa and they can make glasses in abundant and they can produce it at a much cheaper price, right? Or the cost was much, much lower to produce glasses. What Europeans did was very simple. They imported glass cheaply and gave that as money because in West Africa, glass was accepted as money. And in return, they procured all the, uh, they, they obtained all the precious resources from West Africa, right? So over a period of time, glass glass lost its value in West Africa. Again, why? Because with more and more glasses getting imported uh, with the, without much work, glass was abandoned and uh, the money lost its value. Now, the third example I'm going to highlight is, uh, all right, if you noticed uh, red, the character red was played by Morgan Freeman and Morgan Freeman was using cigarettes as money to acquire or to, to get the contraband item from his inmate. I mean, the inmate is on the screen here. So cigarettes are used as money. At least this is movie, but even in real life, there are many jails, right, that have used cigarettes. Now, the reason why cigarettes are used, it is if cigarettes are harder to procure or produce, then you can use it as money, and that's what is happening. Now, we saw three forms of money, right? Of course, one from a movie and two from a real life examples, stones in the App Island, uh, glass beads from West Africa, and cigarettes as money, right? Now, with these three examples, let's look at the functions of money, right? Money should serve three functions. Function one is medium of exchange. Function two is unit of account. Function three is store of value. Let's look at it each, uh, each function in detail medium of exchange. Any good that is used not to be consumed or to be used as an input to produce some other good, right? But its sole purpose is to use it for exchanging it with someone else, something else, then we call that good as a medium of exchange, right? Take cigarettes right from this movie. I'm assuming that nobody is going to smoke inside the jail. And which means what happens, right? Uh, people can't eat cigarettes, so they can't consume cigarettes. They can neither smoke, say, nor eat cigarettes. Neither they are using it to produce something else. The sole purpose cigarette in this particular movie is used is to exchange it with any other item. So cigarette is an example of a medium of exchange, right? Now, what happens is, right, when a particular good is getting used as a medium of exchange, more and more people start using that good as a medium of exchange and that good would have network effects. Imagine, right, if you are a merchant, would you be comfortable pricing an item uh, in five different uh, forms of money or would you be comfortable uh, pricing it in one form of money, right, or one form of currency? Any merchant would say one because it takes much less effort pricing it in one rather than pricing it in five. So as a particular good get adopted as a medium of exchange, it becomes what is called as unit of account, where everything that is bought and sold, whether it is a product or a, or a, a good or a service, right, it'll be, uh, it'll be priced in that particular unit, and we call that as a unit of account. Now, uh, the best way to think about unit of account is... Uh, uh, take, uh, you know, I, I go to the Starbucks, right, often. So I know what a price of mocha is. I'll pay for a tall mocha, maybe close to $5. Maybe a tall latte, I might pay close to $4. Pretty much, or maybe I go to Amazon, or I go and buy a subscription from Netflix. Everything is, is priced in a single unit of account. In the examples that I have cited, they are all priced in USD or US dollars, right? Now imagine a world without a unit of account, how hard life will look like. Say, for example, I'm getting a job offer, right? Two job offers. 
one job offer is uh, giving me three horses and four uh, uh, four hens. The other job offer is giving me an elephant and uh, say one pig. Now, which job offer is better, right? How would I even compare an elef- one elephant and three horses? So it is very, very hard. Without a proper or without a single unit of account, what happens is we have to go back to barter system. I mean, if you look at barter system, right, it's an extremely, extremely complicated system. Say, for example, I have 10 items, right? Let's take a particular village has 10 items and they have to price it, uh, price each item in terms of each other items. So let's take the first item happens to be carrot. Now there are nine different items. Now you would have to price carrot into nine different things. So let's take the first one is orange. How many carrots is equal to one orange, right? Similarly, how many carrots are equal to another item? Now you go, that's nine different uh, possibilities. Now you go to the next item, which is orange. Now you would have to already be priced orange and carrot, which means we would say like orange, how many oranges to onion? How many oranges to another item, right? So that's eight combinations. If you do the math, it's nine plus eight plus seven plus so on you're getting a 45 different uh, combinations or, or possibilities is what uh, one has to deal with. I don't think any human brain and back even in the early days, right? There were no computers. It's damn hard to deal with barter because it's an N squared problem. And anytime you have a square or a cube function, it quickly gets out of hand as the number of item increases. And also, right, barter has this huge problem of coincidence of wants. What do I mean by that is say, for example, I want rice and I have oranges. Let's take Lin Yang rice, right? Lin has rice. Now I go to Lin and I say, Lin, give me rice. I'll give you oranges. Lin says, no, Jana, I don't want oranges. I want, uh, say, meat. Now, both Lin and I have to find somebody with meat who will be interested in buying oranges from me so that I can pay that person with oranges, get meat. I can get meat and pay Lin with rice. So this coincident of wants problem is damn hard. This is why I'm not even sure if barter existed. If it did exist, it must be for an economy, right? That is That produces very few goods with very few number of people. At least that's my hypothesis. I could be wrong. So that's unit of account, right? Now let's get into what is called as a store of value. The idea of store of value is very simple. So the money that I have today, I don't need all of them. I might use say 50% of them, 40% of them or 80% of them today. The remaining 20%, I'm going to store it. Why? With the hope that in the future that I can buy as much as I can buy today, if not a little more of what I can buy today, right? So can that particular good retain its value over a period of time and that dimension is called a store of value of these three characteristics store of value has been the hardest hardest to achieve uh, in human civilization take for example rye stones rye stones had store of value until david okefe came in and he pretty much decimated the store of value by flooding uh, yap island with unlimited supply of rye stones the same thing happened with uh, uh, the glass beads in West Africa. Until the European came, glass was hard to manufacture. The moment the European came, boom, it's gone, right? The money got lost. Now take the cigarettes example. What happens if, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the head of the jail comes up with a law saying that, you know, smoking is going to be banned in jail. And if I spot anyone with cigarettes, I'm going to, the, the punishment is going to be, say, like severe, right? Your life sentence is going to be extended by 2x or 3x, maybe, right? The store of value of cigarettes will go away. Now, if you look at the, some of the modern currencies, right? Take a rupee as an example. Until 2016, we had 500 rupee note and 1,000 rupee note. Uh, then in November 2016, Demon was announced where, uh, you know, 500 rupee note, old notes must be exchanged with new notes. And then the thou- instead of 1,000 rupee notes, uh, 2,000 rupee notes were issued, right? Now, what happened to the store of value for all the 1,000 rupee notes? If you can't exchange it with 2,000 rupee notes, a lot of people, they were not able to if, those, if that money was not accounted for, right, in most cases. And similar examples have been seen, say, with the currency won in North Korea. 
So old currencies were called in and then they were exchanged with new currencies. And then, you know, when they give the new currency, it's not a one-to-one, -one, uh, uh, one, one is to one I'm not going to get, I might get less of that. So which means I'm losing store of value or I'm losing value, right? So of all of the three property, medium of exchange is reasonably easy to get. Unit of account is easy to get. Store of value is something that is harder to achieve. So that's something to keep in mind as we revisit this concept in the later slides. All right, moving on. The next important attribute of money is called as saleability. What does saleability mean? Saleability is nothing but the ease with which I can exchange that money for something that I want to buy or something that I desire to buy whenever I want to without losing a lot of value right? That is, a money is highly saleable when I can exchange at any point in time I want to. Hey, I desire it now. Yes, there is a market for you. Go get it. And I should not lose value. That's the most important characteristics of saleability. Now you can measure scalability on three dimensions. Dimension one is scale. Dimension two is space. Dimension three is time, right? Let's look at the first dimension, which is scale. So scale is nothing but can I, uh, you know, divide this money into smaller and smaller and smaller units? Can I group this money into bigger and bigger and bigger chunks so that I can buy items of higher value? Similarly, cutting it into small, small, small things to buy items that are of lower value. Say, take rice stones, for example. I don't know, right? I'm a stone that is four metric ton uh, heavy. And let's take that big of a stone. Now the villager needs to carve out stones that are much smaller in size uh, so that I can buy tomatoes, I can buy carrots, items that are of lower value, right? That is value per, yeah, of lower value compared to let's take a bigger items like house, etc. So rye stones, I would not say it is highly scalable unless the villagers have figured out a way to carve out tiny stones to mega stones so that you can buy it from... Uh, smaller value item all the way up to uh, bigger value items. Now let's talk about space. The concept of space is nothing but can the money move? Can I move money from, uh, let's take I live in Sunnyvale in California. Can I move money from Sunnyvale to say India or to anywhere I want to? This concept of moving money from one place to another is called as space. Let's get to rye stones. Rye stones, they are extremely hard to move. So on a scalability across space is limited. That is why the villagers have put those stones in a central place, right? On the other hand, I would say that glass beads have reasonable scalability across space because, you know, I can wear a necklace, I can move around, I can take, say, take it from one part of West Africa to another part of West Africa. So from a space angle, uh, so glass beads are better than rye stones. Now, saleability across time, this is what I explained in the previous slide as well. Can money uh, retain its value over a period of time, right? Rye stones retained value until David O'Keefe came in. Glass beads retained value until Europeans came in. But the moment they started flooding the market with uh, more of that particular money, boom, it lost its saleability. So for a money to be saleable, highly saleable, it has to be highly scalable, like a saleable across scale, across space, across time, right? Now, the next concept of money is called as hard money and soft money. Again, right, uh, just for my remembrance, uh, for those who have watched Avengers, you know uh, what Hulk, uh, who are Hulk is and you know who Mark Ruffalo is. When Mark Ruffalo gets really, really angry and mad, he turns into Hulk. So I have named Hulk as hard and hard money. And Mark Ruffalo is a logical and a quiet person. So I kept it for, and it's just an analogy, right? For soft money. And every analogy breaks down at some point other than uh, just the softness of Mark Ruffalo and the hardness of Hulk. Uh, there's no reason behind why it should be this versus that or why I use this image. Now, what is hard money? Money that is hard to manufacture, hard to procure is called as hard money. Money that is easy to manufacture, easy to procure is soft money. Um, sound money must be hard, right? Rye stones, until David O'Keefe came in, hard money. But when he came in and then he used the boats from Hong Kong and explosive from Hong Kong, it became soft money. 
glass beads until Europeans came in, hard money. Because remember, technology in West Africa is really, really hard. So that's why it's hard money. Oh, sorry, technology for making glass in Africa is really, really hard. West Africa is hard. So, but European came, Europeans came in, they imported glass cheaply. Pretty much it became soft money. So, so this is an important concept to remember. Money that is harder to procure is generally sound, right? All ends being equal. With that, uh, here's another important concept to remember. What happens when more money chase fewer goods and services, right? So the balance over here indicates that there's more money than uh, goods and services. So what happens in that situation? Okay. So the way to think about it is, uh, imagine there are 100 units of goods and services in, a, in some economy X, right? And then let's imagine that there are 100 units of money, right? So put the 100 units of money in the numerator and 100 units of money in the denominator. So each good or service is worth one unit of money. Now let's take, right? Uh, Robin Hood comes into this particular island and he says like, everybody ought to be rich. I'm going to inflate the money in the sense I'm going to increase the supply of money by, I'm going to double it. Now, what happens to your numerator? The numerator goes up to 200 from 100 to 200 of that particular unit. The denominator still stays 100. There are only 100 units of goods and services available in that particular economy X. Now, how much would each unit of good and service cost? Two of that unit, right? If it is dollars, it's two dollars. If it is, uh, you know, rupee, it is two rupee. So what happens is, right, you can't get rich by printing money. That's the important point that I want you all to take away. And I'll come back to this slide again and again, right? Or I'll come back to this point again and again, where in an economy, right, uh, if both money supply and the goods and services go up in tandem, then I would call it a sound. Uh, if not, what happens is the purchasing power of money loses its value, where the same unit of money will buy lesser as money is abundant compared to the goods, goods and services. So always remember the productivity of an economy is the most important thing uh, compared to everything else, right? Okay, now, you know, let's continue with, uh, you know, different forms of money, right? We looked at uh, stones, we looked at glass beads, we looked at cigarettes, and then we looked at some concepts of money. Now, what happened, right? Human beings, we are uh, what we tinker, right? We experiment, we innovate. And uh, so our journey of money did not stop with stones or it did not stop with uh, glass beads. It continued. And metals were used as money throughout human civilization. And of the metals, right, your gold obviously is uh, number one because it is used for uh, higher value transaction because value per weight is much, much higher for gold. And the other two forms of uh, currencies or metals that were used is after gold, it was silver and after silver, it was copper. Because uh, copper and silver, uh, they were abundant uh, on earth. Uh, they were used for uh, transactions of lower value compared to gold, which is hard to come by. So they were used for higher value transactions. Now, the biggest advantage with metals is you can homogenize, standardize metals, right? I can make uh, uh, metals of same shape. I can make them circular in the same shape, in the same weight. Now that has a lot of advantage compared to stones. It's really, really difficult to make homogenous stones or let's take even glass beads, right? One necklace will be different from a bracelet. So standardizing metals, it had a huge advantage, uh, which is one. And with the ad advances in metallurgy, standardizing metals uh, became much, much easier. And the way in which currency derived its value or metals derived its value is based on the weight of that metal in that coin. Say, for example, uh, you know, gold, uh, should a gold coin, one gold coin will have say eight grams of gold in it. Or let's take a silver coin should have say 10 grams of silver. I'm just making up some examples in how value was derived by using uh, metals like uh, gold, silver, and copper. And then putting that amount of weight of those metals in the coin gave, uh, gave it value, right? Now, uh, so this is on why gold was preferred over other metals as money, right? This is very, very important where, uh, okay. So as I said, right, gold was 
rarer compared to gold as or compared to silver and copper right there is only a certain amount of gold that is available in on earth now let's look at the chart that is on the left hand side right the 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 gray color line uh, if you look at it it's the total gold stockpiles right starting from 1900 uh, to 2010 i got this from a book called as bitcoin standard i'll share all the references at the end of this presentation so this is where i got the slide from so the uh, the amount of uh, uh, total gold stockpiles was at 100 and you know from this chart it's close to say 170000 to say 180000 tons right now it should be say somewhere around 190000 tons and if you look at the annual supply, right, year over year growth is hovering somewhere between uh, one, one to two percent or roughly, let's take it's one and a half percent, right? Remember the concept of hard money, I said, a money is sound if it is hard to procure or produce. Gold is much, much harder. It's, it's a rare metal on earth. No matter what happens, right, to the price of gold, the new gold that can be manufactured can only happen at a certain rate, right? It can only happen at say roughly at around 1.5%. And this is a record or what the graph that shows, this is uh, looking at over 110 years. And during this time, technology advanced phenomenally. In spite of that, gold supply did not go up that much. Not only that, uh, in 2006, the price of gold, the spot price of gold, went up by 35%, I think, somewhere between the 30 to 35%. Even though the spot price of gold went up that much, the supply of gold did not shoot up a lot. Remember the concept of hard money? If you can inflate the supply, like David O'Keefe or what Europeans did to West Africa, money will lose its value. Gold is one commodity is hard to produce or hard to increase the supply, right? Now, how do you measure? And as I said, money has to be hard. Now, how do you measure? Is there a metric to measure hardness of money? One metric which is typically used is called as stock to flow ratio. If there's one metric that you're going to get out of this lecture or this presentation, I would say uh, Google for stock to flow. It's one of the most important concept in systems thinking that I've seen so many great thinkers use it. So let me explain what it means, right? Imagine, I'm just making up an example. Imagine that the whole earth has 10 kilograms of gold, right? I'm just making it up, right? 10 kilograms of gold has ever been produced and what is available at this point in time, okay? 10 kg is what is available. Let's take in the next one year, that's the time period, that we can produce one kilogram of gold. Stock is 10 kilograms, flow is one kilogram. What is going to be produced over a period of time is your flow. What has ever been produced and still remains is your stock. Stock divided by flow, which is 10 kilograms divided by one kilograms, kilogram, kilogram cancel, you get a ratio of 10, right? So this is stock to flow ratio. For a money to be hard, let this ratio be as high as possible. Now look at the second chart. Gold is the stock to flow ratio is 60, assuming that I'm reading this uh, kind of three-dimensional graph properly, compared to silver, oil, and copper, hardly budged, right? The reason why you say cop oil is uh, so, so low is because we consume all of oil, right? See, I mean, oil that is produced for the last 100 years, I would say minus whatever inventory that we have, everything else will be consumed. Maybe it is used in you know, driving vehicles or driving trucks and whatnot. So the stock, what is available, which is in the numerator is very, very low divided by what is in the denominator is very, very, very high. And when prices go up, right? When oil prices shoots up, suppliers are incentivized to produce a lot more and flood the market. So the value of stock to flow is very, very low for oil. The same as for copper. Remember, copper is a consumption good. It is a great conductor of electricity, including silver. Now, if you look at the periodic table, copper, silver, they will all be in uh, the same column because they are excellent conductors of electricity. They are used as an input to produce some other good. So their stock to flow ratio is really, really low compared to gold, right? Now, maybe I'll add one more before I move on. 
the best way to think about a stock is every item you see on a balance sheet is a stock. Every item in an income statement is a flow because balance sheet is as of date. Income statement is for a period of time, right? So with this example, I would highly encourage you to Google for stock flow or stock and flow ratio and then map back to this particular slide. You will understand it deeply, okay? Moving on. Now, even when coins, I mean, metals were used as money and, uh, you know, coins were used uh, as money, where basically, you know, the, the, the image that you are seeing is a gold coin. coin. Coin clipping was a concept that was used by emperors to devalue money, right? Why did they, what does coin clipping means? The idea is very simple. Take Julius Caesar, where uh, Julius Caesar, uh, the name of uh, the currency was Aureus. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing it correctly, but bear with me. It was called as Aureus, where this coin had 8.18 grams of gold, right? As time went on, uh, every emperor, they would say like, oh, uh, citizens, give me, give, give back your coins. It's like demonetization. I'm going to mine it and give you a new coin, maybe with a new image on that coin. But every time they do that, they're going to put only lesser and lesser grams of gold. In case of Nero, it was 7.27 grams. And then uh, Karakala was 6.55. Finally, to Constantine was 4.55 grams of gold, right? Over the period from the start to over here, uh, say one coin of Solidius had 45% uh, percent lesser gold compared to Julius Caesar Aureus, right? So this concept called it was called as coin clipping. Now, why would any emperor do that, right? And here's a simple reason. Say, for example, every emperor, right, back in those days, they had to go and wage a war. The reason why they waged a war is so that you can... Uh, get uh, the captured country people pay taxes for you you could uh, get as many resources as possible so that your citizens are happy you would go wage a war but you need money for waging a war where are you going to get the money from well there are only few ways to get more money right either as an emperor you would have to raise taxes no citizen is going to be happy when you raise taxes or you would have to raise uh, you know money from people in terms of through bonds I don't know whether emperor or the concept of bonds existed back then. Maybe I don't know if in what forms it existed, if it existed. But those are time consuming and nobody will be happy and your citizens will not be happy. Instead, what they said was, okay, let me inflate the money through coin clipping. It's much easier to do. And nobody is going to notice, at least for now, and uh, when, the, in the, when the money loses its value, it's going to be over a period of time. And that's not my problem. It's the next emperor problem. You see, you just push the problem down to the next emperor or you push the problem down to the future, right? But the merchants are really, really smart. They understood whenever there is coin clipping, they increase the prices accordingly. So inflation kind of crept in. In other words, money or the new coins lost its purchasing power. So coin clipping is something that uh, you should keep in mind. And if you really look at it, I don't think coin clipping is very different from uh, uh, this whole concept of negative interest rates, which we will look at as I continue this presentation. Okay. Now, as I said, right, human beings are really, really smart. They innovate. Uh, the next innovation, right, after metals uh, uh, got started getting used as money, the next innovation was paper money backed by gold, right? Now, say, you know, this is an example that I got from uh, Naked Money, which is an excellent book in understanding about money. So, so imagine that I have, uh, you know, there are uh, 10 bags of uh, 50 pound rice, right? And let's take in this village, uh, we decided to use rice as currency. Now I can, you know, all the villagers can carry this 10 pound, uh, uh, let's take 10 pound bag, let's say carry this 10 pound bag of rice everywhere, right? It's very, very hard because a 10 pound bag does not, is not a good uh, saleability across space because it takes time and effort and who's going to take this 10 pound bag from one place to another. So there came an interesting idea. The idea is going to be this. Instead of uh, me or all the villagers carrying the 10 pound bag, why not we carry a paper that says that this paper is worth a 10 pound bag of rice. And this paper is signed by the head of the chief of village. And we all trust this particular chief of village. Now, what happened is 
instead of moving around the rice, they were moving around pieces of paper. And each piece of paper can be taken to the villager and they can give it if they want to give it. And in exchange, they can get the 10 pound bag of rice whenever they want to. But remember, they were using pieces of paper as a medium of exchange. More often than not, they would be using it to buy something else. And this is the modern invention, right? Where uh, uh, instead of rice, use it as gold, right? So gold, instead of people carrying gold from one place to another, they said, why don't we issue receipts that said this receipt is worth so much of gold and this gold will be kept in a wallet, right? Wallet of uh, maybe the village go down or it could be a central bank. The, those details does not matter. The idea is the key here. Now I have a paper that is backed by gold, okay? Now in the world of metals, right? I told you uh, for higher value transactions, gold was used as money. And for lower value transactions, silver was used as money, right? Now this is a world of bimetallism where you know two metals were used as money. Now merchants have to constantly price it in two different currencies. It's really, really hard. Now with paper money, right? Now I'm carrying pieces of paper. Now this whole concept of having two metals, right? Or two forms of money got obviated. So people are the role of silver uh, in for monetary reasons, it got removed and gold was used as money. That is paper money backed by gold, right? So we enter an era where uh, gold is money, but the gold, I'm not going to carry gold. I'm going to carry paper and paper will uh, be backed by gold, right? And I can redeem my paper and in exchange, I can get the gold back whenever I wanted to. And this is the transition that we went to. From there, okay. Now, from money backed by gold, let's get into how we got into the world of fiat money, which is money that is not backed by anything, right? So to understand it, we need to get uh, towards uh, World War, I mean, get into World War One. During World War One. Uh, governments needed a lot of money because they needed a lot of money uh, so that they can go feed their soldiers, they can travel distances, the soldiers can eat a lot of food and whatnot, right, to fight the war. So they had to print a lot and lot of money. And the table that you see at the top, so these are the nations and uh, these are the currency, how much their currency depreciated against Swiss, right? Against Switzerland. The reason why I'm comparing all of this, again, this I got it from the Bitcoin standard book. Why it is being compared against Switzerland is because uh, Swiss was under gold standard even during the World War One. during World War One, But the countries that went into war, they temporarily suspended currency backed by gold. They started printing more and more money and that money was not backed by gold, right? So to really see how much their currency depreciated by, it depreciated somewhere from say 3% all the way to 61, 69% for Austria, 49% for Germany. The reason why I think US was much, much lower, US entered World War I really, really late, right? Compared to uh, countries like Austria and Germany and their currency depreciated a lot, okay? Now on the right-hand side, you see how much uh, German mark lost its value. Remember German mark before war, it was backed by gold. We call it as a gold mark. And during the war and right after the war, uh, there is something called as paper mark where this mark was not backed by gold. So one German mark that was backed by gold is worth in this year, one, three, six, nine, twelve. It's It's a trillion paper marks, right? So at one point in time, Germany had somewhere between 130 to 140 printing presses to print currencies continuously to keep up with hyperinflation. Prices spiraled out of control. For example, uh, in restaurants, waiters would announce prices every 30 minutes because the value of currency was dropping exponentially. And there was, uh, I don't know whether it is true or not. Again, this is something that I read where, uh, one person, he would be carrying a suitcase full of German marks, paper marks, and uh, his suitcase would be robbed. 
and the robber he would uh, throw away all the money in the sense he'll put all the money down and he would take the suitcase away in the sense the value of paper mark was worthless because of hyperinflation right more money printing again remember right it's no different in coin clipping that we saw any time government needs to spend a lot more money during world war one times they had to spend a lot more they did not have time to dig gold again they cannot raise taxes and make their people unhappy so the only way the fastest way to uh, pay people so that they can fund the war or to fund the war is to inflate your in, is to basically print your own money and the moment money printing happened this is what happened okay and after world war 1 this is another interesting uh, point in time fdr is uh, franklin d roosevelt so in the later 1800 and 1900 uh, us was in gold standard where federal reserve has to keep 40% of currency it issued in gold right so let's take it issues 100 dollars or it prints 100 dollars it needs to keep 40 dollars worth of gold in its vault right so that's by law that it, that that needs to be done but we all know a uh, great depression happened in 1929 and uh, pretty much uh, this uh, crisis and uh, not just rocked the united states it rocked pretty much the whole world i would say and there were a lot of banks that uh, that went down during this time right as a citizen of us you have a choice or you had a choice back then the choice was i can hold us dollars or i can hold gold where i can take gold to a bank and say hey say hey bank give me the gold i don't need dollars give me gold i have a choice either i can hold a dollar or i can hold gold right so the way in which government made people to hold notes or do- dollars instead of uh, gold is by paying interest high interest rates on notes if i own notes i'm going to say be paid the x percent interest say for example if someone pays me 5% interest if i hold usd i am incentivized to hold 5 uh, usd say 100 dollars usd because at the end of the year i'm going to get 5 dollars compared to gold where i'm not going to get an interest on it right so my incentive is to hold it now during the great De- during great depression people lost trust in the whole system right i mean us citizen they lost trust in the system they were not sure how much their dollar is worth and they they thought that the whole thing is going to end so they started demanding their gold back in the sense i mean it's it's i have my dollar give me my gold back where the interest rate started shooting up and up and up now for the government us government to incentivize citizens or anyone to hold dollars is to pay more and more interest now if interest rate goes up businesses would find it really really hard to borrow money and already the economy is in a deep recession or a depression and this is getting completely out of control that is when fdr said that you know he i mean it's called as confiscation of gold right he passed an order to get back all the gold and gold certificates from people and in turn he paid 20 dollars and 67 cents for one troy ounce of gold what does a troy ounce how much is a troy ounce it's around 31 31 ish grams right so pretty much us within the us it cut the cut off from the gold standard so that it can print a lot more money without this 40% law or restriction that is out there so you print the money you boost the economy so what happens when more money gets printed the you know there's surplus money right the demand for money will go down as more and more money is coming out so the interest rate started going down right so think about it this way um as the money supply shrinks your interest rate goes up that's what happened when people wanted to exchange money for gold as money supply increases when us forced people to surrender their gold and started printing more and more money interest rate started going down and down and down and here is another smart thing that uh, you know fdr did where remember he paid uh, 20 dollars and 67 cents for for one troy ounce and he took that and then he went into the global market and repriced gold at 35 dollars an ounce think about it for a minute right he bought gold at 20 dollars and 67 cents for an ounce and he exchanged it with uh, you know in the market he repriced it at 30 35 dollars so in a way us dollars got devalued by 40% 
2637 to 35. So the dollar got devalued. Now, even though in the US, the connection between dollars and gold got cut, in the international market, gold was still used. And the way in which it was used is how is this, right? Every other currency had a fixed exchange rate with dollar and dollar had a fixed exchange rate with gold. That is for one try ounce. Remember, he went into the FDR, went into the global market and he repriced it at $35. So of say a pound and uh, USD is going to be of uh, the same exchange rate. It's a fixed rate for $1, uh, for, sorry, for $35, you are going to get one try ounce of gold. Right. So this system beautifully worked. What happened was every country uh, surrendered their gold into the US and US in turn gave them $35 per tri ounce. Now international trade happened easily because everything was priced internationally in terms of dollars because everything is a fixed exchange rate. Say, for example, uh, uh, you know, back in those days, remember I told you about the weight of gold to currency, say for example, a pound say weighs one gram of gold. I'm just making it up. And say a franc weighs 25 gram, 0.25 grams of gold. Now for one pound, I would be paying uh, four francs. The reason is one pound is equal to one gram of gold. One franc is equal to 0.25 grams of gold. So one gram divided by 0.25 grams. So you are going to get four francs, right? So that's how the conversion worked. So pretty much it's the same idea where the exchange rates are fixed, where your USD exchange rate is fixed with all other exchange rates and USD is fixed with gold where you get a troy ounce for $35. Everything was going fine. Remember, right, this happened during World War I uh, and this is famously known as a Bretton Woods Agreement. Bretton Woods is a place in New Hampshire. You, you should Google this up uh, in terms of how they set it up. And, and remember, this happened during or right after World War I when every major country on the planet, they got uh, beaten down because of the World War. And countries like Japan were pretty much recovering right from the World War, from World War II. And America was in a much dominant position and it was able to command whatever it wanted to command. But what happened in the next two to three decades, other economies started to build their, build their economies out and they started becoming more and more competitive. Now, what happened when they become more and more competitive? They were able to produce goods at a cheaper price of high quality. So there is a demand for dollars started going down, right? I mean, say US, UK is exporting more, Japan is exporting more, and all the major countries are exporting more than what US is exporting then the demand for dollars will obviously go down. And US was spending a lot more money in, in war and you know, in, on its military, and its competitive position was weakening. Now, here is a situation where US, there is a, a glut or a lot of US dollars that are out there. US competitive position is weakening. Now, other countries started questioning, hey, does US have enough gold? If I go back and give dollars, can they even give gold back to me, right? And uh, that question uh, turned into a suspicion and other countries started exchanging, giving out dollars and they started redeeming gold, right? Now, US did not have enough dollars to redeem, to allow countries to redeem. And uh, that is when uh, Nixon ended the convertibility of US dollars to gold. And pretty much what happened, this happened in the 1970s where uh, remember the fixed exchange rate of all currencies and fixed exchange rate of all uh, uh, for a dollar to gold 35 tri ounce that got completely broken and it is all floating he allowed the everything to be floated and a dollar cannot be given by other countries uh, and then get their gold back so that is completely broken and the beauty is remember us paid 35 uh, tri ounce i mean for a tri ounce they paid 35 dollars uh, Today, a tri ounce is worth $1,800. So pretty much it's a sweet deal for the US, I would say. And not only that, even today, US dollar is the global reserve currency. What do I mean by that? Say if India wants to import oil or anyone wants to do anything, pretty much um, most of these currencies, I would say 60 to 70% of the currency on the planet, it, uh, those exchanges happens on USD. 
right? So now we are in an era where we have fiat money, where the money is not backed by anything, no gold, no metals, no nothing. So money can be printed and with modern computers, you don't even need a printing press like Germany's 130 or 140 printing presses. You don't need any of that. You just click a couple of buttons, boom, money can be created, okay? Now let's get into what is called as uh, fractional reserve banking where I'm going to show you how money gets created and how Fed creates its money, right? Imagine that, uh, you know, there's a village and the village has one bank, right? Let's pretend that there is only one bank that Lynn and I are starting, okay? Now, that one bank, uh, we do a sales pitch and we convince one villager to deposit $100 with us, okay? So the villager deposits $100, into the bank or into our bank and we call this as round one, okay? Now, Lynn and I, we observe the pattern of the villager. The pattern we observe is the villager is only spending $20 of the $100 in, a, in any given period of time. He is leaving, you know, he's actually spending say less than $20. So what Lynn and I decide is like, why should we keep all $100 in our bank? Why not lend out the remaining 80. Anyway, this person is not spending or he's hardly spending even $20. Why don't we keep 20 so that he comes in and then he can get what he wants. So we say, let's reserve 20, 20%, right? So 20% of $100 is $20. We loan out uh, $80, right? Uh, so let's take, we loan out to another person. That another person, what is he going to do? This person uh, is going to keep the money in the bank, right? Uh, because the reason is even he goes and uses that 80 to buy something, uh, he is going to put that money back into the bank or the other person is going to put that money back into the bank. Now $80 comes in, right? What we give out as loan will come into the bank because it's the only bank in that village, right? Now it's the same route. Now I reserve 20% of $80 is $16. I reserve $16. I can lend out $64. Okay, I lend out $64. Now that $64 comes into the bank again, we reserve 20%, which is $12.80. And then we again create a loan of $51, right? With a 20% reserve ratio, how much deposits are we creating? If you go, you continue the cycle, we ended up creating $500. Now, where is this 500 coming from? The inverse of reserve ratio, that is one divided by 0.2 is called as money multiplier. This is how much money gets multiplied in a world of fiat currency where money is not backed by anything, where you can just, you know, create loans out of the deposits as long as I am within the reserve ratio of 20%. So $100 became $500. Now the loan, how much is $400 and the $100 is the reserve, right? This is how fractional reserve works, okay? Now here is the kicker. At any given point in time, if all the depositor comes and asks for their money, there's nothing because remember the only reserves that are out there is 100 because all the remaining 400 is being lent out. So there's no money there. So this is why, you know, run on the bank is something that needs to be prevented where if everyone comes panics and then they want to uh, want their money back, it's going to explode, right? So this is what is called as fractional reserve. Now let's do one more example, right? If I make the reserve ratio to 25%, money multiplier will be four. Why? Because one by 0.25 is four. Now look at how much deposit gets created. It's 400, four X of this. And then the loan will be 300. Remember, I have to reserve 20%. Uh, which is, which is, uh, sorry, 25%, which is 100, right? 100, 25% uh, of 400 is 100. Let me put it back to 20%. You can see how this whole uh, machinery works, okay? Now, this is uh, how fractional reserve works. Let me move a little quickly here. Now, let's understand how Federal Reserve creates money. So this is an example that I got from uh, Federal Reserve of Chicago workbook. So they published this workbook back in the 90s. A lot of the details should still remain the same. So I'll just quickly walk through it. 
Okay, Federal Reserve Bank, uh, for them, for, for if they want to create new money, this is how it happens. They purchase government securities, right? They are going to buy sec government securities. This could be US government bonds. So what do they do when they go and buy a government security? They have to buy it from somebody, right? I mean, it, it could be uh, it could be somebody with that security who is willing to give it uh, uh, give it to Federal Reserve. Again, right? It's it's a market. There's a there's a bond market where they are going to go and purchase. So they are going to buy uh, it for ten thousand dollars. So what happens when the Federal Reserve buys it for ten thousand dollars? Their assets of securities. Remember, they are buying U.S. government securities. It goes up by ten thousand dollars. Now remember, in balance sheet, asset and liabilities, they needs to match. They need to match. Now, when the asset goes up by ten thousand, the liability, in the sense, they have to give this ten thousand to the person who they are getting it from, and they are not going to directly hand it over to them. They will put in something called as a, a reserve account for that bank. These are called as bank reserves. So they'll put that money there. So that's why their liability, in the sense they are liable to pay $10,000. Let's pretend that in this particular place, there's one federal reserve. Federal reserve is nothing but the central bank of the US. And let's pretend that this town has only one bank to simplify it, right? So they increase their liability side by $10,000, okay? Now let's call this bank as bank A, the only bank in the system. Their assets, right? I mean, the money that they have with Federal Reserve, the reserve balance is their asset. It goes up by 10,000, okay? Now, remember, Federal Reserve bought it from somebody that somebody has an account with this bank, bank A. This bank A needs to put that 10,000 in their checking account, right? It's called as the customer deposit. That goes by 10,000. Simple, everything balanced, right? 10,000 assets on Federal Reserve goes up. 10,000 on liability on Federal Reserve goes up. The same thing happens with Bank A, okay? Now, in this example, the example that they have, what they had in the workbook uses 10% reserve ratio. In the sense, remember money multiplier, I can create 10x more money, one divided by 0.1 because 10% is the reserve ratio, money multiplier is 10, right? Now, what happens is, so there is $10,000 in reserves. Now, how much is the deposit? 10,000. Now, if I have to keep 10% reserves, how much 10% of 10,000 is? $1,000. Okay, I reserve $1,000. Now, how much is the excess? $9,000, right? Now, bank can take this $9,000 and they can create or loan this money to someone else. Basically, they can create money and then they can loan this money out. Now, what does the bank do? The bank creates a loan. A loan for a bank is an asset, okay? Asset for the bank. Now, let's take uh, Lynn is taking this loan, right? The bank deposits that loan into his checking account or it's called as the borrower deposit. And it's a liability for the bank, right? Because remember, this money is should be paid to Lynn or Lynn is going to take this money at whenever he wants to. So they are increasing their deposits by 9,000. Okay, now the deposit went up by 9,000 more. Now let's look at the state of the picture, right? In this example, there's only one bank and then the way in which Federal Reserve Workbook has been written, they are saying all blank banks club together. It's all the same. I'm taking one bank. They are adding, it all, adding all the bank details. It should, it's the same. Reserve of 10,000, loan of 9,000, total assets is 19,000. Now deposit got created 10,000. Remember the 10,000 that was created was over here when uh, when the US, I mean, when Federal Reserve acquired or purchased the treasury from that person. Then using the remaining 9,000 uh, loan was given. So which means what happens is your loan amount goes up uh, to, uh, sorry, uh, the deposits of 10,000, loan of 9,000, totally it goes up to 19,000. So here is a workbook that I'll be sharing after the presentation so that you can play around with it. It's the same idea, US, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Federal Reserve purchases it for 10,000. All I need is, you know, the deposit goes up by 10,000. I just need uh, 1,000 as a reserve. 
so which means this excess can be lent out as a loan round to this excess is lent out as a loan 9000 is given out okay now the total deposits will go up 10000 plus this 9000 is 19000 now i reserve 10% uh, of uh, 9000 uh i yeah sorry i reserve 10% of 9000 which is $900 so which means my original reserve of 1000 plus 900 is $1900 i can i have an excess of 8100 now i reserve 10% of that you basically play the cycle that we did with the fractional reserve system what happens is from a $10000 federal reserves purchase the bank is able to create $100000 right and then it created a loan of $90000 remember the required reserve is $10000 i'll share this slide it should be very simple for you to work it out so the whole idea here is by fed purchasing these bonds it is able to increase uh, the loans and the deposits that are in the system and the money just balloons right now where is this where is fed getting this money from well fed can create its money it just prints this 10000 dollars okay now basically right the the excel sheet that i showed you is what has been worked out here the end result is what you need to focus on the total deposits is 10 100000 loans and investments are, are 90000 and that's how it works now the same process can be done in reverse remember federal reserve like it is expanding the money supply it can contract the money supply how remember in the expansion case it purchased securities right it purchased us government securities if it wants to contract the money supply what it will do is it will sell us government securities so in this example so federal reserve is selling 10000 dollars worth of us government securities so the assets of federal reserves goes down by 10000 dollars the money that it owes to bank in this example bank a goes down by 10000 dollars okay the assets that the bank had with federal reserve what is called as a reserve account goes down by 10000 dollars customer deposit goes down by 10000 dollars remember in with a fractional reserve of 10% if $10000 of deposit goes down it accounts for a reserve of 1000 10% of 10000 is 1000 which is what you see that is okay 1000 is taken care i am still short of $9000 in reserve so what federal reserve uh, did with this particular action is now banks have to kind of reduce this $9000 of reserve now how would they do it they would have to either sell government bonds and other financial assets that they have and suck out the money from the system or once the loan gets retired remember you cannot go and call your loans back say for example if somebody bought a mortgage or say some a business bought a one year loan you cannot just like that go and say like give me my loan back because it's a contract that you have entered for a year or two or three you would have to wait for those loans to be retired but after that you might not be able to issue new loans until you meet this reserve requirement where you are deficient of 9000 dollars in reserves so for 9000 dollars you need to suck out 90000 dollars from the system remember it's it's again the simple math for me okay i'll go here for 10000 addition i have created 100000 deposits if i take 10000 out of the system or out of the reserves i need to suck out 100000 remember why the money multiplier is 10x because of the reserve ratio of 10% right this is how the money magic of creation of money right basically money is nothing but credit and you can create credit by moving your reserve balances up and down and reserves ratio reserve ratios up and down at least this is how fed has been playing the game but a few things changed recently or maybe in the last decade i'll walk you through what they are now okay we saw this okay now why is federal reserve playing this game of uh, uh you know uh, buying and selling securities this action of buying and secure selling securities are called as open market transactions right which federal reserve does uh 
every country has their own say, federal reserve like in india it's rbi or central bank and in the us it's called as federal reserve now here's an interesting question right why did us bank not call itself as central bank instead call it as federal reserve is something for you to uh, ponder over uh, so what 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 is the goal or the ultimate true north of federal reserve why are they doing all these things whatever they are doing right this buying and selling of securities it's called as monetary policy they are doing all this monetary policy to achieve maximum employment right they want most of their people or if not all of their people if possible to be employed to keep the price stable remember we don't want uh, to have uh, what happened in germany during and right after world war where a mark uh, one gold mark was you know or one paper i need to pay 4.2 trillion or a trillion paper mark for one gold mark i we don't want hyperinflation so they want to keep prices stable and they want to keep moderate long term interest rates remember when the rates are moderate it encourages businesses and uh, people to borrow money and invest in the future so this is the reason why federal reserve engages in this game of uh, uh, buying and selling securities or also called as open market transactions okay here's a simple chart right when the reserves go up that is remember the reserve balance of 10000 example that i gave when the reserves go up rate i'll explain what federal fund rate is the uh, fund rate goes down and uh, when the reserves go down federal fund rate goes down so now what is federal funds rate federal fund rate is a rate at which banks borrow money uh, of, uh, amongst each other so that they meet their reserve ratio say for example there are two banks okay now let's take federal reserve has kept a reserve ratio of uh, 10% one bank has a surplus in the sense they have more reserves compared to another bank now the other bank needs to meet this rule if not they would be penalized by federal reserve so let's take bank b is not able to meet this reserve rule so they'll go to bank a and they'll say like hey bank a can you lend me money from uh, lend me some of your reserves so that i can meet my uh, obligations now bank a is not going to give money its reserve for free so it's going to charge an interest rate that interest rate that bank a charges b is called as a federal funds rate now if there is enormous surplus of reserves obviously right the rate will go down everybody is going to happily meet why should i go and borrow so the demand for reserves will be low remember if, the, if there's a surplus of anything the demand for it is low which means the rate is going to be low that's what uh, the first row says the second row is if the demand for uh, uh, reserves are high in the sense reserves are very very low i need to meet my reserves then the federal funds rate go up okay now um, i'll just quickly pass through the slide uh, so the policy decision that federal reserve does to maintain the federal funds rate these are short term rate remember banks borrow to meet their overnight obligation we set the direction for short term interest rate and the short term interest rate guides the long term interest rates which in turn guides how consumers and producers behave and which in turn maintains optimal employment rate with stable prices so what federal reserves had or have is this tweaking this federal fund rate imagine this is a machine and federal funds rate and your long term interest rates are your levers uh, what fed does is it moves these levers up and down so that through these levers it can control the outcome of how consumers and producers will behave which in turn will control the maximum employment and stable prices right um yep okay but something interesting happened uh, and the whole concept of reserves itself is not being that useful during and after the global financial crisis okay now this is the chart of excess reserves right reserves is what remember i mean you know what reserves are at this point in time so if you look at it till this point the reserves that the banks had were not that much now federal funds rate was very very efficient 
by uh, when when fed moves the reserves up and down right the reason is there were uh, not much of reserves so which means for banks to meet its obligation it would have to borrow money so federal funds rate had a meaning to it but during global financial crisis what happened a lot of mortgage backed securities i think uh, um, there was a huge credit crisis where people started losing trust in the system where pretty much some of the government sponsored entities like fannie mae and freddie mac they were going down and under so fed has to step in and they started printing a lot of money in the sense when i say printing money they just put digital entries to purchase these securities they purchased a lot of government securities they purchased a lot of securities mortgage backed securities from fannie mae to freddie mac why by pumping in more and more money fed was bringing back the confidence in the system during global financial crisis without it what happened was the system was about to collapse remember the example that i started where fed and goes and buys 10000 dollars of government security from somebody now imagine fed doing this at a massive scale buying all government securities buying mortgage backed securities so when you buy a lot of this what happens you you digitally print more and more and more money there's enormous quantities of money that are out there so when the supply of money goes up what happen the demand for money is not there there's enough so the interest rate goes down now when fed buys more and more us treasuries what happens the price of the treasury goes up because you know there's more demand for treasury when price for treasury goes up interest rate on these interest or interest yield on these treasury goes down the way to think about it is imagine there's a stock which is worth 10 dollars and the stock is paying you 1 dollar of dividend okay what is the dividend yield 10% 1 dollar divided by 10 dollar my yield is 10% now let's take there's a lot of demand for the stock now this stock one 10 dollar stock became 20 dollars now the dividends let's take is the same now what happens to the yield yield goes down by 5% yield got cut down to half so price and yield or interest they are inversely proportional so by fed printing a lot more money printing in the sense digital sense by a few key strokes they acquired a lot of financial assets from the market i'm just going to show you the balance sheet of federal reserves uh, in three time snapshots right this is the fed's balance sheet in 2007 fed's balance sheet in 2014 fed's balance sheet in 2020 okay now look at it right the size of federal reserve balance sheet is 869 billion 4.5 trillion 6. Point, close to 7 trillion this is a snapshot as of august 2020 this is after covid but this does not include uh, the recent stimulus that happened so this number should be much much higher so what i did was i just compared the size of fed's balance sheet with uh, the gdp of the us so it used to be at 6% it shot up to 26 it shot up to 32 basically it is printing more and more money remember the example that i gave you when fed prints money asset went up because it is buying assets asset goes up so securities goes up reserve balances will also go up look at what happened to reserve balances and the currency right the liability side it was at 869 billion 4 and 1/2 trillion close to 7 trillion and i'm sure this is way above 7 trillion right now i haven't checked what it is because the pdf was available as of august uh, 2020 i'm i'm sure it is out there i need to double check but it should be much higher than 32% so this is how much of money printing fed has done to get out of uh, global financial crisis and over here if you see uh, the excess reserve basically what fed was trying to do is it was slowly and steadily trying to taper off from all the uh, loose monetary policy that it was having but then covid-19 stuck it did not have a choice it has to do what it did is the right thing so it started printing more and more and more that's the current state of affairs as we speak now with so much of reserves that are out there the concept of reserve balance you know this slide that i showed does not make a lot of sense for it to control the short term interest rate so what it did in 2008 it passed i mean congress passed a law that allowed federal reserve 
to pay for bank reserves, pay interest on bank reserves. So instead of controlling the supply of, you know, controlling the level of reserves up and down, Federal Reserve said to banks, do not worry. I'm going to pay you X percent on the excess reserves that you are having. This X percent kind of set the federal funds rate now. Now, Fed is controlling its short-term interest rate through the interest that it pays to each of the bank on its excess reserves, okay? Just seeing if I have to say something else on this slide. Okay, now uh, imagine, right, there are two banks. Now, if bank A is getting 1% interest on, uh, from say Federal Reserve on these excess reserves, it has no incentive to lend money lower than 1% to another bank. Because see, why would I lend money to some other bank or anyone else if I can park the excess return with Fed and Fed is paying me 1%, right? So that way, Fed is controlling the short-term interest rate by all these treasury notes that it is purchasing and bonds it is purchasing, it is controlling the long-term interest rates. And all of it is happening through what is called as money printing. Okay. Before I end, I want to show one other slide uh, and then I'll share some references and I'll end this presentation. So if you look at what is going on across the globe, uh, this is the balance sheet of a major central bank, Federal Reserve Bank, European Central Bank, Bank of Japan, Bank of uh, England. I got this slide from, uh, from a note that uh, Paul Jones sent out, which I'll be sharing along with the presentation. So if you look at it, in 2002, the global uh, central bank balance sheet, it was at, uh, it, it was, it's the blue color over here, right? Which is the left-hand side. It was at 15%. Right now it has shot up all the way to 45% of GDP. So what all the central banks are doing, they are basically printing money, right? There's a concept called as debt monetization. What does it mean as say, for example, if government, right? If it is running a deficit, what do I mean by deficit? Let's say government is earning $100 through income taxes and all other sources. Let's take if it is uh, spending $110, it is running a deficit of $10 or yeah, right? Because it's, it's spending more than it is earning. Now government needs to fund this deficit. Now, how would it fund the deficit? Well, it has to raise taxes. Remember I said uh, in the example of emperor, nobody would be interested in, uh, they won't be happy when you raise taxes or they would have to go to public and then they borrow money from public. But when you borrow from public, the problem is there's a concept called as crowding out. You're competing with other companies. So you're, you're going to increase the interest rate. Remember when there's more demand for money, what happens to the rate? The rate goes up, right? So governments wants to keep the interest rate low, interest rates low. So they say, oh, okay, what? I'm going to issue these uh, bonds or treasuries, whatever it is called as, right? And I'm going to let my central bank print money and then, you know, basically what central bank is doing, it is printing money digitally. It is paying it to the central government or fed, I mean, to the government. In exchange, it is holding all these government, government treasuries and it might be getting some interest rate out there. This concept is called as debt monetization. Basically it's money printing that is happening. It's like the right hand, you know, uh, doing, giving something to the left hand, right? It's like they are handshaking. And that's how the current exchange between uh, the central government and the central bank and major economies are playing out. Now, is this a cause of concern? How is this going to, how is this movie going to unfold? To be honest, I do not know. And in fact, right, there was a question uh, for those of you who listen to Berkshire Hathaway's and recent annual meeting. Uh, someone asked a question to Charlie Munger on MMT. MMT stands for Modern Monetary Theory. And then Charlie Munger said the uh, MMT worked out uh, beautifully to everybody's surprise. And we don't know how this is going to unfold. And too much of this is might not work out well is what he ended, right? Let me unpack some of it based off of my understanding. Uh, so whatever my understanding is, I'm going to share it. So what MMT, right? Modern monetary theory says, a monetary sovereign. So what do I mean by a monetary sovereign? Say US, United States is a monetary sovereign where it control its money printing. Unlike Greece, Greece can't print Euro, right? You have EU, which has to do all of that. 
but us government can do that because remember us government and central bank they are like bye bye right they can do that left hand and right hand so they can do it beautifully so us government can print its own money and the debt of us government is all denominated in its own currency okay so they are saying monetary sovereign can print without any issues and it does not depend on tax dollars as long as okay as long as i'm just pausing that as long as remember the balance slide that i showed as long as the productivity of the economy is keeping up with this money printing you cannot get get rich by printing more money so the key is this can us government and all central banks continue to print money and do this debt monetization and play this game and still remain productive or is there going to be inflation that's going to get out of control i do not know but at least right if you uh, listen to what buffett said and if you read uh, you know some of the articles that that are on economist and other uh, sources there are some signs on inflation in the economy inflation is heating up is it going to be a secular trend or is it going to be a one off thing is yet to be seen okay uh let me see if i have to share something else i'll be sharing all of this right so do not worry and uh, okay so in terms of references right a lot of things that i learned came from uh, bitcoin standard naked money and uh, new depression right from richard duncan uh and then a lot of references that are out on my speaker notes that i will be sharing so if you find that this inform i mean okay maybe uh, one more thing that i need to say right all the writings that i said uh, all the credit goes to these sources and uh, a lot of friends i spoke to anything that i said that is completely bonkers and incorrect i take the responsibility and it has got nothing to do with these sources or anyone okay now with that um, am i buying bitcoin am i a bull on bitcoin a big disclaimer i'm neither a bull nor a bear as, as i said in the beginning i'm a curious student uh, learning about money history of money and how this whole money printing works and how the balance sheet uh, you know, works it, it's so fascinating right to put it all together so with that i do not own any bitcoins and i'm continuing to be a big believer in investing in equities and uh, you know diversifying it in equities uh so i mean both in uh, stocks some bonds some real estate a little bit of gold and some reserves as cash and i do not own any as of now i don't have any plans to buy bitcoin and with that uh thank you for patiently listening to me this long and i will be uh giving this to lin yang who will be taking you through the ins and outs of bitcoin and cryptocurrencies